This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. The deepest hole mankind has ever dug was 12 kilometers deep. We'll have to do several hundred times better to get to Earth's center, but if we can do it, we'll gain access to resources beyond our imagining. So today we'll be looking at how to go about accessing the Earth's mantle and core, and the reasons why we might do that. We should start by acknowledging that Earth is immense. So often on this channel we look at the scales of celestial bodies that dwarf our pale blue dot, which makes it easy to forget that that dot is still huge. If you could somehow explore 2,000 new square miles of Earth's surface every day, it would take you 80 years just to see all the land. And those would be busy days, because there are over a million mountains to climb on this planet, and over a hundred million freshwater lakes to swim in. But the Earth's immense volume is even harder to visualize than its surface area. Humans occupy only a tiny portion of that volume, a few tens of meters above and below the wrinkly surface. Beneath us is the real Earth, a trillion times more mass in space than we use on the surface. We often talk about mining other bodies in space but you would need to harvest every rocky object in our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and all the other asteroids and minor planets, all the moons around all the gas giants, to gather as much material as we already have right under our feet. Steel production has been over a billion tons per year and rising for decades now, and it might hit 2 billion tons per year in our lifetimes, but there are 2 billion trillion tons of iron inside the Earth. At our current rate, it would take us a trillion years to deplete our local iron supply, if we could reach it all. All of the rare elements we plan to mine from the asteroids are far more abundant on Earth too, it just appears that crossing hundreds of millions of kilometers of radiation soaked vacuum to get those elements will be easier than digging them up. The best estimates on gold is that there's enough here to cover Earth's entire land surface in shiny coins like Scrooge McDuck's vault. But 99% of Earth's gold is not in the crust or mantle, but the deep core. But of course, this is only a best guessed estimate from available data, which is limited. I'm often asked whether dark matter is real, given that we can't even see the stuff, which makes many folks dubious. I typically reply that we can't see any Earth's core either, in fact we can actually see dark matter better than we can our own core, based on its gravitational effects on galaxies. Figuring out Earth's composition is way trickier and does involve a lot of estimates that get refined and adjusted over time. We do get some data, mostly about the upper mantle, from volcanoes and oceanic trenches, though even these peaks below the crust are hardly a direct sample, so we have to infer a lot of things. We can for instance look at meteor samples or the metallicity of our Sun to determine their chemical compositions. Since everything in our solar system condensed in their current forms from the material of the same planetary nebula, we can then assume they represent a solid sample of what our world would have been made from. We can use seismic data from earthquakes and volcanic eruptions to study the rate at which seismic waves travel around the world, and, based on things like speed, coherence, and refraction, infer the makeup of Earth, since seismic waves behave differently when passing through different materials. But these data are only informed models. And as science has shown us again and again, you're almost guaranteed to encounter surprises when comparing a model to the physical reality. So instead, we need to get down there and get ourselves a nice good look, all the way down to the heart of the Earth. We only need to do it once to know it's possible, and once we determine it's possible, such a journey to the center of the Earth will open up countless new cool opportunities, like travel. Points on Earth that are on the exact opposite side of the planet are called antipodes. Jump down a vacuum tunnel in Beijing and the first leg of your journey will speed you up so much that you'd have more than enough energy to fly back up the shaft and emerge in Buenos Aires, the almost exact antipode to Beijing. The entire trip would take about 84 minutes and would require no fuel. If we can drill one tunnel through the Earth, we can drill multiple ones. We could use magnetic levitation trains to travel curved shafts through the mantle and the core instead of spending 20 hours on a plane flying from New York to Vietnam. You get there in a tiny fraction of the time, again spending no fuel. Drill enough of these tunnels and suddenly Earth becomes much, much smaller. Of course the Earth's core can provide a lot of power too. 
Earth absorbs only one billionth of the Sun's total solar output, but even so, compared to those levels of energy, geothermal power is quite weak. Nevertheless, geothermal power is still an enormously powerful source of energy. It is estimated that 47 terawatts of heat energy is radiated from the core to the surface. It might not be a bad idea to bleed some of that heat off while at the same time putting it to work. An interesting notion, we'll get to that later. As you'd suspect, the main issues for drilling through the Earth are the immense heat and pressure, both of which climb the deeper you go. However, we have a method for dealing with ultra-high pressure called active support, as discussed in the Space Towers episode. Interesting notion there that we'll get to later, but just because the planet's quite hot as we get deeper down, doesn't mean it needs to be or that it behooves us to let it be if we can change that. It is very hot and very high pressure and those are big issues for drilling deep. However, we have a technology for dealing with ultra-high pressure that's quite suitable for making tunnels from, and which in general works better when cooler, that active support technique. And if we're willing to go all in, we could tunnel out the Earth with just modern technology by first cooling the planet. Of course doing such a thing would fundamentally alter our planet, not just a bit of landscaping either, but turning it into an artificial thing. However, that's nothing really new to us. When it comes to getting more living space, you can go find more caves to dwell in, or you can cut them out deeper and use the rock you removed to expand our habitable space. You get a lot more living room building out of stone than cutting into it too. Our houses are mostly empty air after all. Cut a cave out to have twice as much living volume and you've got enough stone to build a hundred times as much living area. And nicer living area at that. Caves are nasty places to dwell. And of course our ancestors rarely lived in them mostly using them as temporary shelters while on the move. But as a basic concept, that's pretty much humanity in a nutshell. We like nature, but we're clever and like to use our brains to improve it. A planet is just a random pile of cosmic garbage crunched together by its collective gravity, and our whole ecosphere is a thin layer of scum growing on it. We can do much better. Indeed we've looked at alternatives to living on planets often on the show, see the Megastructural series, particularly O'Neill Cylinders and Dyson Spheres. But today, we'll look at improving our planet. To do that we have to start somewhere though, and step one is just finally making it all the way through the crust to the mantle, which would get us about 1% of the way to the core, and sadly the easiest 1%. Our first two big attempts, Project Morehole and the Kola Superdeep Borehole, didn't get us there though the latter drilled over 12 kilometers down. One of the newer plans revolves around the Japanese deep sea drilling vessel Shikyu, which hopes to drill through a thinner piece of the crust, hopefully getting started by 2030. Now that's a purely scientific endeavor, not industrial, but it's where you start. It will let us learn more about the actual composition of the mantle, and the boundary layer between it and the crust, the Moho discontinuity. This may also give us far better insights into how earthquakes occur and offer some means of early detection. Seismic waves move quite fast, many times the speed of sound in the air, but even a minute of advance warning could save many lives. However, if you know how something works and you can get your hands on it, you can potentially take action too. Don't rule out being able to model it so well we could detect earthquakes well in advance, and potentially even use controlled detonations to release the pressure more safely, which we may look at more in the future. But that's small stuff when it comes to getting down there for raw materials and energy. We need to go big, and in some ways that's easier. It's very hard to bore a deep skinny shaft, slow work and constant issues drilling and shoring. A wider shaft is more work but in some ways less hassle. There are many ways you might do this, and one we thought up involved detonating a series of atomic bombs, and so we nicknamed it the Nuclear Jackhammer. As you might guess, it uses bombs to excavate material for the hole. Thing is, when you're cutting down to rock, be it from the bottom of the ocean or from land, you've got rock or magma at the bottom of the shaft under much pressure and air or water above providing less pressure. Now that's fine if you want magma to constantly bubble up the shaft to be extracted for minerals, and indeed that's the concept behind the moho straw we looked at in colonizing the oceans last year for mineral extraction but it does make it a pain to drill deeper and shore up those tunnels. That moho straw by itself is quite handy. You can build immense thick towers in the ocean from floor to sky, 
and indeed deep down into the magma and all the way up to space, using active support to hold the tower up, powered by heat engines using that magma for heat and water for cooling and working fluid, and just gorging yourself on all the energy and raw materials. But again, not good for going way deep, as that magma is going to be constantly flowing up to fill the hole you just cut, or bombed. Hypothetically you could run this whole thing with a drilling fluid at the bottom that was heavier than rock, something like mercury or molten lead, then your newly blasted rock and magma will float up to the bottom of that for scooping off, while the weight of that dense metal keeps the pressure on the bottom of the hole to prevent a flood of magma. This needs to be big because you're using nukes to do the cutting, and this also involves a lot of heavy fluid, potentially billions of tons of it, and losing some of it as it seeps into the magma and gets blown clear by the atomic charges. Though this isn't as big a deal as one might think since the whole point of such an endeavor is to gain access to huge quantities of metals. However, it might make more sense to steal a page from our spaceship propulsion options, namely the Orion nuclear pusher plate design, that's a spaceship that runs by dumping atomic bombs out the back and detonating them at a short distance where they slam into a big thick metal plate on a spring which absorbs the shock and translates that into a smooth acceleration for the rest of the ship in front of it. We're going to do the same thing here, using a massive metal plate with a shaft we can pop open to drop a nuke down. When the nuke goes off it shoves the plate up while blowing more matter clear from the shaft, though you might use more of an Archimedes screw drill bit arrangement that was being made to spin by the blast too and lifted that last round of matter clear or some similar arrangement. That bit or screw or plug, our jackhammer tip, is very heavy and is pushing against the magma below. After each blast it's going to drop back down, shoving the newly blasted material over it. This thing is nothing but millions of tons of sturdy, heat-resistant metal full of cooling and radiating equipment that is probably suspended on the end of super tensile materials like graphene or carbon nanotubes to help keep it lined up and dropping back down correctly or a huge spring shaft with another heavier plug above it adding more weight. You can also be generating insane amounts of power off this too, as it is as much an engine as a jackhammer. You'll be dropping your shoring material down as you go on the side of this tunnel, and we'll get to explaining what that's made of in a moment, but obviously you don't want your nukes going off right next to your pusher plate, but deep down enough that the rock is absorbing most of the blast. So your nuke is likely to be along the lines of a bunker buster bomb, you slam it down real fast and hard into the next layer you're blowing, possibly by having a big mass driver in that jackhammer shaft. This makes our jackhammer a mix of atomic bomb and kinetic bombardment device, akin to the rods from God concept, a very sturdy, very fast, dense tipped projectile with a nuke in it. You might use raw slugs of uranium accelerated down that shaft so fast they crunch and detonate without need of a chemical explosive to initiate the process. You might shoot one down a bit below critical speed to detonate that cuts down a ways and follow that immediately with another moving a bit faster and setting off the blast when it hits. Indeed this is essentially the gun style nuke used in more primitive atomic bombs. Possibly overkill as you might be able to come up with alloys that can handle the heat and pressure and just drill conventionally. Such materials would make showing up the tunnels easier too, but we have a technology called active support that we often discuss using for making things like launch loops and orbital rings that can handle the pressure. You can see those episodes for a detailed discussion of the basic technology, but as a quick recap, classic materials can only handle so much pressure before they crunch under the force. But by making a tube with matter spinning around it very quickly, kept on course and sped up by magnets inside the tube, we can create something absurdly strong. As a basic concept, think of a hose with no water going through it. You can step on it and crunch it easily enough, but if we turn the water on it presses back, it gets harder. Wrap that in a loop with a pump on it propelling the water around and you've got something fairly sturdy. Active support of this type simply dials that up to 11 allowing you to make something that can withstand immense pressure, so long as you can provide power to it. Of course you don't have to supply power if you have superconductors, but those don't work at room temperature, let alone a thousand degrees, so we either need way better superconductors, or way better cooling, or lots of power, or all of the above if we can. 
Potentially you might be able to rig up that mantle stream inside the support ring to be a coolant too, but more to the point, there is an awful lot of power available when you're cutting deep into the earth. Indeed our job gets easier if we remove that heat and turn it into power, we can tunnel and mine and build deep down way easier if it's not hot. If we can tunnel down there and keep those tunnels short up, that also provides an amazing transport system too, one that follows shorter routes curving around the planet and so long as you keep them as a vacuum, lets you run vacuum trains akin to the Hyperloop concept for essentially no power, you literally just fall to your destination, a gravity train. You can also use such tunnels for more than just surface travel. A great big long tunnel can also be used as an acceleration tube to get to space, see the Mass Drivers episode, though of course this requires you add a lot of energy, but all that heat down there makes a great power source to run such a thing too. Now if you're wondering why the center of the planet is hotter than the surface, the bit that gets hit by the sun's warming light, there's two major reasons. First, it takes a ton of energy to lift matter out of a gravity well, think about all the heat and energy of rockets lifting small cargoes into space, and you had all that heat and energy added when the matter fell down originally to clump into a planet. Left to itself, it will cool down, but this is a process dependent on size, small stuff cools faster and has less heat per unit of mass too, due to its lower potential energy density from its weaker gravity field. We're talking billion year time frames for large planets. To add to that, Earth's core has a ton of uranium in it producing heat as it decays, adding about 50 trillion watts of new heat, quite a good deal more than our electric production nowadays, though fairly small compared to what we get from the Sun, which is around 4,000 times as much. But it's all down in the core which is quite the insulator, so that slows the cooling of Earth immensely. The total heat in the center of the Earth we'd need to remove to get down to comfortable temperatures is over a million, trillion, trillion joules. Needless to say, just yanking all that out would cause all sorts of problems, as the densities of materials is often highly variable with their temperature, and you might get mega earthquakes doing that too fast. This isn't much of an issue though, because even if we tried to cool the planet down over a few thousand years by just running radiators down deep and into the oceans to move that heat to the surface to radiate away, it would involve emitting around a hundred times the heat Earth currently does. That would be one enormous power plant to say the least, but not a very helpful one since we'd be hotter than Venus while that was going on, and presumably thoroughly dead, though we'll discuss habitats inside such heat momentarily. So you either have to go quite slow, cooling down the mantle in the core, millions of years, or you have to erect truly massive space towers for conducting the heat away to huge space-based radiating panels. We did discuss those devices, what we call forests, fractal obelisk radiation emitting space towers, in our Matrioska Shell Wards episode. They're particularly handy in this application too, since you can be extracting all that mass from the mantle to build many layers of concentric spheres around Earth using active support, running on all that power, to create huge new living surfaces for humanity and the rest of Earth life. Of course you may have another way to purge that heat. We're not really sure how the thermodynamics of black holes works, but it's been suggested you could use them as heat dumps, and black holes are handy for keeping your gravity at the level you want if you're hollowing out planets or expanding their surface area. See Colonizing Black Holes for details. Normally, black holes are millions of times more massive than Earth, or more, but that's simply because of the forces needed to generate an implosion sufficient to cause one naturally. Supernovae in very big stars occur when the inner core has fused all the way up into iron and a detonation occurs in the layer above, blowing the higher layers away and blowing that iron core into a tiny black dot. We've discussed artificially making smaller ones before, and one of the methods is to take a giant iron ball and implode it with a lot of nukes. It's conceivable you might be able to do that to our own core, though doing it in a fashion that lets you wrap an active support shell around it right after, and without wrecking the planet, is a lot trickier, but theoretically possible. Once you have, you can adjust your gravity to whatever you like, feeding it cheap matter like hydrogen and this lets you circumvent the problem with gravity changing as you hollow out a planet or expand it. You might be able to move lots of heat energy down to that black hole at that point, though you can also use such things as enormous hyper-efficient power generators too, 
Again, see Colonizing Black Holes and the Matryoshka Wards episode for details. Lastly, we could just go live down there in the heat. Better alloys are always nice, but we could build big spheres down in the magma, with tubes rising to the surface, like a big thermometer with that tube and ball on the bottom. You make the shell mini-layered, with the outermost one being all about handling pressure and temperature, and the next being full of water pumping through to remove that heat, or some other coolant fluid, rising back up to the surface and presumably running a lot of power generation along the way. You may want additional layers for redundancy and added protections, but your last layer is going to be two sheets with nothing in between, a vacuum, same as a vacuum flask for keeping coffee hot, or liquids cold in a thermos. This would be where folks lived, and you might have ports on the bottom or side to let magma in that you could run mineral extraction and manufacturing on, or just ship to the surface for that. Not that folks have to live there, but they could, and that shaft down need not be rigid. Ideally you wouldn't want to be so that you could sway around in the various seismic waves, Indeed it could be like a pendulum, swinging around slowly down there and attached at the top at one or two points. If you have two, it has to swing in basically a straight line, those could also serve as surface to surface gravity train paths. The top in this case probably being the bottom of the oceans, but you could always have transport lines back to the surface, or just have a city down there, as we discussed in Colonizing Oceans. For places you've cooled down, or insulated well and sturdily, We do have a lot of other options we already looked at in subterranean civilizations. Such things take a lot of power to make particularly livable between lighting and cooling, normally, but in this case they are effectively free since you're using heat engines with the mantle or core as the hot reservoir, not burning some fuel to make the heat, and you actually want to remove all that heat anyway. I should note before we wrap up that this has applications off Earth too. Some worlds are far easier to access the core from as they are less massive and cooler to begin with. For others this might be the only way to really live on them, for Sithonian worlds larger and hotter than Mercury or Venus, or for living in the depths of gas giants. You might also want to live this deep to protect yourself from an enemy, since the surface of worlds is quite exposed and easily attacked, and cities deep under the planetary crust are very well protected. It's not necessarily a bad place to be putting bunkers for keeping a protected seed of your civilization. Lastly, if something happened to Earth to take away our sunlight, like we got ejected from the solar system by some rogue planet or black hole passing through our area, these techniques can be used to save your civilization as the surface goes dark and starts freezing. You could burrow ever deeper as things slowly cool down. And as I mentioned, the time frame for a world like Earth with a molten core to lose all its heat, even with the sunlight gone, is many millions of years. That's a lot of time to figure out alternatives like fusion to provide new power, or even drift through deep space and use some of that energy and mass to nudge yourself to a trajectory in a habitable orbit around another star. Somewhat of an amusing approach to going up and out to new stars, digging down into our world's depths first but sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards, or downward to go upward. We're in the holiday season so let me knock off something from your holiday to-do list, gifts. If you're watching this show, you probably tend to feel like I do that knowledge is one of the best gifts you can give someone. If you know someone who likes to solve puzzles or find out how things work, I've got a brilliant gift suggestion for you, brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning community with over 60 interactive courses and mini quizzes and puzzles, plus daily challenges that help get the brain warmed up for the day. Brilliant makes learning fun and easier, and their online community gives you places to discuss the material or ask questions, and their mobile app's offline feature lets you take courses even when you're not getting a good signal while traveling for the holiday season. This year, get the gift of knowledge for your loved ones by gifting them Brilliant. It's such a fun way to nurture curiosity, build confidence, and develop problem solving skills crucial to school, job interviews, or their career. Go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and grab a gift subscription to help your loved ones finish their day a little smarter. Speaking of fun gifts, next week we'll have some fun taking a look at space pirates, folks who tend to help themselves to other people's gifts, and we'll see what form piracy might take in the distant and even not so distant future in space. But before then, we've got a special bonus episode coming up this weekend, Paranoid Aliens, 
and we'll ask what it might be like if instead of us being paranoid about aliens, they were paranoid about us. And two weeks from now we'll close out 2019 on SFIA by taking a look at interstellar civilizations and asking how time affects them, from the incredibly long signal delays and travel times to just the notion of some civilization trying to maintain stability when spread across a million stars and a million years. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to get yourself a Christmas gift, take a peek at some of our awesome SFIA merchandise on our website, IsaacArthur.net. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.